Hello, welcome back to part two of the Graham Verner interview where we are talking about business and how you can do ethical business, how you do green business and how permaculture, which Graham is an expert in, um, relates to business and can relate to business and what we can learn from all that. So the reason this is part two is because part one was going along very nicely indeed. And and I just realized I didn't have my video on, but I'm back now. <laughs> Part one was going very nicely indeed, but um, then it started freezing the curse of Zoom and uh, as, as an anarcho album was almost called way, way back when. So, OK. <laughs> um, yeah. So hello, Graham. Welcome back. And where we were, I was asking, are there kind of examples in nature of how uh, how we can sort of make a. Oh, a, a a good society how we can behave in sort of nature type ways without necessarily having the economic abundance that is denied so many people these days and you were talking about then mutual aid and how that kind of gets uh reflected in forests it, it, um, I yeah it, <laughs> i'm not quite sure where we got to when when it all kind of like collapsed no, before, well, but i think you I were talking, talking about, about how kind of mushroom bits and roots were kind of intertwining yeah yeah and that kind of uh, mycorrhizal relationship um yes. very quickly you know i'm not kind of quite sure where it cut off but mycorrhiza being the kind of jo a joint kind of joint enterprise if you like between the fungus and the, the 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 plant the tree you know where the fungus and the root kind of come together and i think i was making the point that um Kind of, this is very much a kind of symbiotic. Well, it's kind of as I go on, you will find that it's more than symbiotic. Um, but it was only kind of relatively recently, you know, maybe a hundred years or so, kind of recognised this is actually a symbiotic, mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and that was probably considered a fringe idea for quite a long time. And so I even got gardening books in kind of nineteen forties. That will say, oh, if you've got mycorrhizal, because they were believed to be parasitic, these fungi, you know, that and they're they're taking from the plant but giving nothing back, and they'll be detrimental to the health of your kind of trees, your fruit trees and whatever. So if you've got mycorrhizal fungi growing in your garden, you know, get rid of them, pour paraffin over them, anything, destroy them, you know. And then it was kind of realized, no, actually, that's not a good idea because actually it's really um a um, positive relationship um but so the literature has changed but even so quite a lot of the language still reflects that kind of patriarchal colonial mindset and if you read even kind of books that are kind of being written today they'll say oh yeah michael mycorrhizal fungi um that the fungus will colonize the plant roots or the um the fungus will take over the plant roots so it's still very much in this kind of language of colonialism and maybe slightly patriarchal um but there was a feminist mycologist this person who studies mushroom called lauren olian um and she talks about this concept of my consent which is you know quite a nice little play on word myco the fungi and consent and this is based on the work of more recent kind of soil scientists and agronomists and people like that who's who study this thing and they found that as the fungi the you know the root the um mycelium is approaching the the root the, you know the, the root hair it's on a microscopic level it would actually send out little kind of signals electric electrical signals to the root kind of um and now seeing its presence and kind of making overtures if you like and it's kind of like that the fungi is saying hey you know um you've got a lot of carbohydrates no sugars that i kind of you know i can make use of um and i've got um you know if we kind of get it together i can access for you all these other nutrients like um that you might not be able to get hold of like phosphorus and nitrogen and stuff like that um 
maybe we could get it together and uh, kind of party and have a little thing going on. And if the root is up for it, it will say, yeah, I'm up for that. And it actually kind of opens up these little kind of channels. So far from the plant, you know, kind of invading and colonizing, it's actually kind of this consensual relationship that's kind of going on under the soil. And I really like that kind of model, you know, not the kind of queer mycology, mycologists and feminists are kind of taking this as, as you know, it's it's a different model than that colonial uh. kind of patriarchal, dominant, you know, invasive thing. Um, yeah. And again, yeah. it's kind of quite new. A lot of this stuff is very new and we don't really know what's kind of going on under there. But some of the stuff we do know, it kind of creates a... A secondary root system so the tree has got its own root system that can reach so far into the soil to get water and nutrients but this kind of fungal network is like a secondary root system that kind of i can't remember the figures of but it's kind of something like 800 times the surface area of just the roots and so it can access all these not just nutrients but water so it can kind of you know get if it's in a period of drought, it can get water to the tree, it might not otherwise be able to. And where it gets really exciting is how it kind of um, moves stuff around. So they found that uh, it's sometimes called the, um, the wood wire web. It's almost like the model of the internet. You know, nature thought of this a long time ago, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Transmitting kind of information and nutrient around under the soil. Um, so if you've got part of the, um, I'm going to get to the point of this in a moment, but um, if you've got kind of an area in the in the woodland or forest where um, it's deficient in nitrogen, for example, and the trees are kind of suffering a bit there because they're not getting enough nitrogen, and there's another place in the forest where there's too much or a, a surplus of nitrogen, it will actually physically move the nitrogen from the place where there's a surplus to the place where there's a deficit and kind of actually actively nurture kind of trees that are kind of maybe suffering or, you know, from a lack of nitrogen. And the other thing they found that um, it can also send six, so say there's a deer, something like that, that's coming through the woods and it's, you know, they're going to feed on the leaves of the tree, but, you know, it might be getting a bit, over enthusiastic and it's damaging the tree and it's eating too many leaves that tree will send impulses or messages through this mycorrhizal network to other trees saying there's a there's a kind of really hungry deer coming in and it's damaging all the trees and these other trees will start producing these compounds that don't taste nice to the deer so the deer will kind of think ah and so it's, it's incredible this stuff that we're only scratching the surface of the communication that's going on. And so we think of, we tend to think of a, a forest as a collection of, you know, this is where I'm kind of maybe applying it to maybe business, business or yeah. community. Yeah. But we tend to think of a, a forest as, you know, a collection of, you know, individual trees and each one of, you know, like we think of a, society the collection you know the mrs you know we talked about thatcher no such thing as society we're all a collection of atomized individuals um but actually you know going back to the forest it's kind you know because these michael risal connections that actually joins everything up that it's for mutual benefit that actually it's a misnomer to think of a tree as an individual it's they're just one component of a almost a super organism if you like does that make sense it, it doesn't just make sense. I think it's a really kind of uh, a really radical sort of way of looking at things because yeah, yeah. You, you just mentioned. Oh, that. oh, and it gets better. Sorry, I'm, I'm, <laughs> sorry, it gets better. Um, and then I put the icing on the cake. Um, <laughs> this is the icing, and I'll say this stuff is all quite relatively new science, you know, and um, mm. there's so much we don't know, but very re well comparatively recently i think it was about 1996 it was a soil scientist at the united states department of agriculture called sarah wright uh interesting it seems to be the women scientists who seem to be making these um discoveries and connections but um 
she identified a substance called glomalin, um, which when this stuff is going on between the plant and the fungi, it generates this kind of um, protein, or glycoprotein into the soil as kind of almost a, a byproduct, this thing called glomalin. And it's kind of a sticky jelly-like substance that actually holds the soil together, you know, all the particles and, um, but what it also does, it holds masses and massive amounts of carbon. And so actually, I think if glomalin is present in the soil, it will hold something like 50% more carbon in the soil than if there is no glomalin. And so kind of, we think of, you know, if we want to capture, car you know, we want to lock up carbon, we think, yeah, we'll plant trees and rear forest, uh, which is, yeah, that's great. But it's not actually the tree, it's actually the fungi, it's the mycorrhizae that are actually doing the heavy lifting when it comes to taking that carbon out of the atmosphere. And so to summarise, we've got this kind of mutual aid thing going on that has, you know, all this kind of, you know, mutual benefits sharing of nutrients, kind of protection from external threats. And as a byproduct, or maybe it's not the byproduct, maybe that's the primary product, it's generating this kind of soil health and taking carbon out. Um, yeah, so I guess my kind of thing is, you know, maybe this is kind of radical ways, we, you know, can we apply that, that model or that concept of nature? You know, it's gone from competitive nature you know the fungi that are just kind of damaging the trees and then we kind of think well actually that's not what's going on at all in fact there's this level of kind of mutual aid that's going on that's what can we learn from that i guess is yeah term. absolutely and and that winds us right back to the start doesn't it really of how, how can you make your business more ethical how can you make it more green etc i think mm. It sounds to me from what you're saying, I, I didn't know a lot of that stuff, but it sounds to me like basically people have always used nature and particularly Darwinism uh, and still do, mm. Jordan Peterson and people like that, as a model for how the natural order of things should be. And that's how people run their businesses as well, quite often competing with rivals and, you know, looking, looking for looking at it in a competitive kind of way rather than in a mutual aid way. So if instead of the... Uh, the way we've grown up looking at nature, all these new discoveries, which I presume is through new technology, all of those discoveries are actually showing us that nature isn't modelled like that, and we mm, can look mm. at things in a completely different way, uh, meaning you're just ahead of the curve, essentially, with all the stuff you're teaching. Mm, well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Think, yeah. I think it is just it's a paradigm shift, I think, you know, actually you know without going down another kind of rabbit hole you know um permaculture is very much about systems thinking and looking at how systems work in their you know rather than just the individual components how everything kind of um works together mm. and um without going too much into systems thinking um i guess there's kind of two kind of models of thinking about systems um, I think um, Karl Popper, who's a um, philosophy philosopher in the 1960s or 70s, I'm not sure when, he proposed this idea of clocks and clouds. If we come across that term, clocks and clouds. Um, but, you know, clock systems is where you can kind of look at it. It's kind of mechanistic. Um, you can see the components you know, like the mechanism of a, of a clock or a car engine, for example. Yeah. Um, something goes wrong, you can see the thing that's gone wrong, you know, with a clock, it'd be like one of the, you know, maybe the uh, the mechanism's wound down, needs winding up again, or it might be one of the uh, the little cogs in there is worn out. Or these days, probably because the battery is worn out or some other part, you can take the battery out, put a new battery in, you can take the little cog out that's worn out, replace that, and the clock goes back to its kind of working state. Um, but then we've got cloud systems, which is more kind of complex, real-world systems. Um, 
as in there, you can see them from a distance, but the closer you get, the more kind of amorphous they become. You try and reach out and touch it, it'll just dissipate before your kind of, you know, before your hand. Um, it'll behave in kind of, you know, there'll be all kind of external forces that are kind of, you know, yeah, the climate. <laughs> This is the Newtonian model of the universe against the yeah, yeah. quantum model of the universe, essentially, isn't it? Well, not versus, yeah. but you know, the two different ways of looking at it. And I think again yeah. that the Newtonian model of cause and effect and everything is a machine mm. is we're just finding out stuff that shows that isn't the whole picture by long chalk, really. I think. And the whole thing, you know, that also, you know, we may think we have a some, you know, something goes wrong in a system. And we think we have, you know, this whole idea of unintended consequences. You know, you try and fix the thing that's gone wrong in a real world complex system, and you'll have all these kind of things that you just didn't anticipate, and it will, you know. So, um, yeah, which has ultimately mean, led us to where we are with the yeah, climate absolutely. crisis. Yeah, 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 and um, yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, there'll be. Someone will come up with some wonderful solution. I think, yeah, an example might be, I think they, rabbits were introduced into Australia to, for, I think it was a food, you know, there were no rabbits in Australia before kind of, you know, folks kind of, you know, Western, you know, colonisers turned up and yeah. oh, we need kind of food, you know, let's, uh, rabbits, they're nice fluffy animals and we can, you know, keep them and we can uh, use them for food you know, great what could possibly go wrong and then you know <laughs> and then within no time they become this really kind of um you know kind of pest animal that's kind of damaging local ecosystems so what's the response to that oh, we'll reintroduce myxomatosis and that kind of has a whole load you know so this whole thing about unintended consequences and i think you know you're saying with the climate thing we're seeing that I was going to talk very briefly about Danella Meadows, who's um, book, written a book called um, Thinking in Systems, a primer. And I, I'd, I'd recommend giving that a read. Again, I can put up a, you, or if you can put up a link in the um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. comments. Um, but she's written this really nice book called Thinking in Systems that kind of really kind of goes into this stuff and how systems work and why systems fail. And I'll be teaching it on courses. I think I came across that book in about 2010. And I read it and I thought, really needs to be including this stuff on the permaculture course. And she talks about these places to kind of intervene in systems, you know, where we can, can actually, you know, kind of have leverage, if you like, in terms of um, changing the outcomes of a system or making a dysfunctional system become more kind of you know work better and so i've been i've been running this session on courses around 10 years and i read the book about 10 years ago and i've been running this session and then um around about the time of the um the lockdown the pandemic we we're all in lockdown i kind of found i had a lot more time to read and i thought i've been teaching this session for 10 years i really ought to reread that book you know and give it a you know refresh and i kind of was reading it and there's this kind of section in there about um, why systems go wrong, what not to do, you know, in a system kind of thing. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is exactly the thing that, you know, Boris Johnson has just announced. Is this thing not to do? Or, you know, if you want to kind of change the outcome of the system, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's things like um, one of her core things, you know, um, getting good quality, timely information about, you know, how a system is functioning, how a system is, because if you've got good quality information in a timely fashion, then you can make decisions, you know, what needs, what do we need to do? And that was about the time when, you know, at the start of the pandemic and the government decided, oh, we're going to stop testing everyone. So we're actually going to stop, actively stop gathering information about what, what's going on here. I think, what the... Yeah, and I was reading this book, and it's like every single thing the government were doing is like the thing you shouldn't be doing at this point of where we're at. But anyway, that's so more some of the things you should be doing. Oh, that she kind of talks about 
how to change a system, which I guess is what we're talking about here. Um, it's also it's different, I won't go through them all now, but these different ways in which we can kind of intervene. Um, uh, but at the kind of her lowest, you know, least effective thing to do is she talks about um, adjusting the numbers. So, you know, just tweaking, you know, spending a little bit more money on the police, for example, or spending, you know, kind of stuff that's kind of maybe tweaking the figures a bit. I mean, an example might be if you're in an area with a high crime rate, for example, or high antisocial behaviour, there was a how do we address that? And the default thing might be, well, we'll install more CCTV cameras or we'll put, you know, some extra police on the beat to kind of patrol, which, you know, might help, but it's not really getting to the root of what's going on here. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. And then, and then right at the other end, her biggest, you know, if we want to change a system, this idea of paradigm shift, actually move from, you know, this whole way, you know, we look at the world to a new paradigm. And I guess that sort of ultimately, I guess that would be the goal. Isn't it? How, do we, how do we shift paradigms? And I guess that's, you know. Well, absolutely. And and how, do, how does that apply to business as well? For you, quite clearly, yeah. you can just include all this stuff within your business because uh, <laughs> that's, what, that's what you do. But how do I include mm. it in my business? That's a, that's that's a sort of more of a pause for thought one really um yeah you know. i think i think that's the thing to talk you know it, i don't think there's there's not a prescriptive answer to that girl you need to do xyz things yeah i think it's maybe thinking about you know some of the things we talked about how can that apply you know well business um, is just a part of life isn't it i suppose so if you, mm. if you start internally from the inside out i guess you change yourself and that manifests in the way you run your business and in every decision that you that you you make particularly the ones where you're not too sure of i guess um then that mm. conversations like this will hopefully have have mm. a sort of food for thought type effect on anyone who's, mm. who's listening and, and then is in the future faced with some kind of decision where they could have a an effect for for better or ill as they see it or as we see it whatever i guess yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i think um um how much time have you got um probably 15 minutes i'm thinking probably before i've got this other meeting basically yeah okay fair enough then um yeah i was going to list a few kind of permaculture principles which i could kind of just maybe list off very quickly oh please do yeah you know um i mentioned the ethics you know i think we're always coming back to earth care pair shares and the people care at the core there. Um, but then there's these kind of principles of permaculture, and there's loads of them, and I'm not, I haven't got time to go through them all. Um, but to see basic principles I will go through. Um, work with nature is, is you know, quite a good one, I think. So I guess that... Uh, well, if I just read them out, work with nature, and then there's this idea of everything gardens or everything kind of modifies and changes and has some kind of effect on its environment and how can we um how can one utilize that um minimum effort for maximum effect which is a favorite of mine and quite often that's really around the observation you know what's actually going on here yeah you know, and, and that's very relevant I... to business that one yeah 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 minimum effort for maximum effect yeah. um and this idea the problem is the solution Solution is another one. Quite often, a situation appears problematic or challenging. You know, if we kind of maybe change the kind of mindset around or think of it laterally, it could be, oh, actually, you know, the problem, you know. Yep, there's a saying that entrepreneurs see opportunities where other people see problems. So, again, yeah, so thing. that one, yeah, so which is, got a, yeah. Got a thing there, yeah. Um, every element should serve many functions. And every function should be met by many elements, which is sometimes called like the redundancy principle. So if something in, you know, I mentioned the um, that idea of the polycultural income or polycultural livelihood. Um, you know, I was talking about um, just as if you've got an acre of land 
and you'd plant you know one variety of wheat on that acre of land and for some reason your crop fails gets a disease or you know some um locusts or um something like that eat them all you know some pests, plague of locusts eat some, yeah eat some, we've had everything some, else. I, I was trying to think we don't really get the locusts <laughs> in this country but you know yeah. aphids or something destroy your crop you kind of got yeah. nothing got no livelihood but the same acre of land if maybe you've got some fruit trees there and you're growing some vegetables and you've got polytunnel and you've got different varieties of fruit and different varieties of tomato and maybe you've got a building that you can make into a classroom or something it might be that um you get late frosts and you lose your apple crop well never mind we'll you know we've got tomatoes or you know they'll do well or Maybe a really bad year with everything. Well, never mind. Maybe you can run some courses and workshops in our classroom or, you know, so you've got all these different, each one of which might not make as much income as if you, you know, just that week. If you combine them all, you're probably actually getting, you know, a bigger return. And I think I mentioned, you know, when I um, kind of went part time in my day job, and, you know, I was doing a bit of driving and I was doing a bit of care work and I was doing a bit of agency work. And, uh, you know, none of those brought in as much as my kind of reasonably well-paid day job at that time. But when you combine them all, you know, that this kind of idea of a polyculture rather than monoculture, you know, it's kind of a, and it's in, it's more interesting as well. So I think that, yeah, that, yeah, that quality of life principles of. Yeah. That kind, yeah, that principle of redundancy and having multiple, you know, multiple skills, you know, and multiple, um, and which then lead, you know, that idea of yield being unlimited that I talked about, you know, every yield, you know, yield being limited only by our kind of imagination. So, yeah, those little six principles there are kind of might be quite useful. I was going to talk through each in a bit of depth, but we haven't really got time now, but, um, Yes, yeah, so work with nature, everything gardens, minimum effort for maximum effect. Uh, the problem is the solution. Every element should serve many functions. Every function should be met by several elements and yield being limited only by imagination. So I think they're kind of quite a useful starting point. And I say quite often yeah. on the course, I'll talk about me in a gardening context, but then Gardening as a metaphor, how you can apply that to kind of a business model or a social model or yeah. Um do you, where do you think this else? <laughs> where do you think this all fits in with this um again September 2023, this kind of modern malaise of culture wars? Um I suspect <laughs> I suspect if you know some Daily Mail editor was watching this they'd sort of have us both firmly in the woke camp or something like that oh, of course um, yeah uh, i like to think so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and ironically probably <laughs> so with jordan peterson whose model is often mm. based on he talks about lobsters doesn't he and as an excuse for sort of the darwinian of his belief that oh, you know I'm not really that familiar but uh, yeah. I, yeah i should look him up i should look him up after He's a yeah. name I see, but I haven't really investigated him, I must admit. So well, I'm not gonna talk about him here because no. people are listening. <laughs> well, um well, we've only got ten minutes, so but talk about something. <laughs> let's let's finish off by talking about your own business then. How 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 different is it to be sort of running your own business to having a job like you used to do? And and how how do you think you run your own business in terms of uh congruence with your values and in terms of ways that might be different to you know your average dude out there who runs a I don't know taxi company or something um yeah oh, that's an interesting question isn't it um I, I mean the reality I guess is I'm kind of making up the go along most of the time you know like muddling through um and quite often I think it's just sort of like um say like I work with a, a friend um Sherry Fuller, she's a practitioner of uh, appreciative inquiry, which I'm not sure if you've come across. But, yeah. Um, which, yeah, it's kind of another. Maybe we need a third. Maybe you need to talk to Sherry actually as well. Get her foot for one of your podcasts because she's yeah, great. surely. Well, give me um, your details. Yeah, I will do. Yeah, 
But um, yeah, so we just kind of like, she does this thing called appreciative inquiry, which is really about kind of reframing um if, if I say it's like about having a positive attitude, that sounds a bit glib, but it's and it's not that simplistic, but it's seeing, you know, seeing opportunities rather than problems, I suppose it's that in a nutshell. But you know, and, and very much applying that to kind of like business, you know, she does a lot of talks for businesses and stuff, which is why I think she'd be a good guest. Um but yeah, we um I've kind of lost my thread slightly. Um, running your own business. We, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and um, yeah, and we we kind of have worked together and stuff, and yeah, and she oh yeah, I don't know what to say. And one of her kind of things is say yes to everything, you know, which you know, like, and because you don't know what's opportunity, and like you know, it's like saying yes to every opportunity that comes along. And uh, I'll That's finish nice. with a, you know maybe and. Another yeah. example, um, something that, um, something I started doing was taking cuttings of willow from my allotment, um, making it into um, artist charcoal, basically. Um, and that's kind of quite a nice little thing. You know, it's about that kind of multiple, you know, multiple income streams. I haven't really followed it up lately, but I kind of make, artist charcoal, I just do it in my wood burner. You put it in a biscuit tin with some holes punched in the lid, okay. stick it in there, and it's just charcoal on a, on a miniature scale. So I've been doing that and um, making this charcoal, put it in a nice fancy box, put some nice black tissue around it, which I actually nicked from, like, um, just nicked a pile of black napkins when I was in a pub, <laughs> basically. <laughs> you use them kind of like... Put a nice little picture on the box and you've got this kind of quite nice little niche kind of product that you might see in a farmer's market or a little gift shop or something like that. It costs me nothing to make. You can sell it for like, you know, six or seven quid or something and you've got like artist, handmade artist charcoal. So that was the thing that I was doing as part of that kind of little, you know, it doesn't bring in a lot of money, but, you know, sell a few around about Christmas time. It's a little bit of extra income. Um, so I just had I put up a photo on Instagram of my bike down my lot with all this willow kind of tied to it with bungees I was going to take home and stuck that on Instagram as you do. And another friend of mine saw that photo, got in touch with me and said, Ooh, can I come down to your allotment and with my partner and cut some willow to make into bearing a bearing bow. And I said, I don't know what a bearing bow is, but yeah, that sounds all right to me. Uh, do you know what a bearing bow is? Oh. No. Okay. <laughs> it's um uh well she's actually a capi she runs a capuera kind of class in South End or Capuera Academy. Um which is I don't know what that is. Okay, it's like a Brazilian kind of martial arts dance thing. Okay. Um, so she kind of, and and they do a lot of this kind of dancing. So it's a Brazilian one stringed instrument. You kind of hit this string with a uh, kind of bow. It's like tightened metal string, and it kind of produces this sound. And it they use it as like an accompaniment for their dance. So it's a traditional Brazilian instrument, basically, um, which I didn't know at the time. So anyway, she came down to the allotment with her partner and she was like cutting the bits that, or they were cutting the bits they needed, you know, the, the right length and the right thickness and this, that and the other. We managed to involve um, some of the people from um, the uh, Project 49, which is, you know, the day centre for adults with learning disabilities. They kind of came along and they're enjoying it because she, she works with them as well anyway with her capybara thing so we had that going on we had um sherry who i just mentioned she brought her partner down who was at the time on long-term sick with stress from his day job so he kind of like you know it was good for his kind of well-being so it was great day cutting you know chilling out and sharing some food and and we thought and then at the end of it 
he got what he needed, or they got what they needed for these bearing bells. And then she's saying, we should run a course on this, you know, how to make your own bearing bells. And then we can, we, so we were talking about doing that. And of course, then lockdown happened. So it all kind of went by the by. But it was just that kind of act of just saying yes to something. Like you kind of, and I, I saw it as having all those, those eight forms of capital. They were all kind of in there as well. Yeah. You know, with the living capital, the willow being converted into the um, material capital, which was, you know, the wood needed to build the instruments. We had the kind of the learning, the guys came along, they got experience using tools. There was the well-being stuff in there. And it kind of it encapsulated, like, in an afternoon, all those eight forms of capital, I think. And the cultural one as well, because, you know, obviously it's getting the uh, Brazilian community visible in the South End, which, you know, can only enrich the town's cultural capital, you know. So it was all yeah. in there, I think. And that's just one example, you know. I think it's just like, for me, on a day-to-day, -day, it's like, I suppose I've got a... Um, a course sort of thing going on, like you know, I run courses quite regularly. I do a full design course once a year. I'm doing an online course once a year, and then do sort of quite a lot of um, shorter courses. So they're a kind of a core income stream, if you like. But there's yeah. all like some little sort of specialist courses, you know, like I've, I've got one coming up just before this meeting. I just had an online meeting uh, with a local gallery about running some workshops around charcoal making and, uh, you know, so all these different little opportunities come up and, uh, yeah, so it's, um, and then there's the whole, um, the zine thing as well, which is a completely different tangent in a way, you know, the, the South End on zine book and stuff like that, so it's, some things bring in money, some people, some things don't, you know, but they lead to other things, you know, so I think that's... And they all bring... To everything. They all bring in one of the kinds of capital, I suppose, which, of course, is... Absolutely, yeah. That's why people have hobbies, isn't it, you know, as well, so... Yeah, yeah. And there's always the danger, of course, you know, quite often people have a hobby, which they enjoy, and then they kind of monetize it, and then it stops being a hobby, and it becomes a... You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, people are... The classic people like you know get into making jam or craft ales might be one you know people enjoy brewing they make you know then, oh let's uh, I'm going to ditch my day job and uh, set up a little brewery and then it becomes like oh god you know like, I've mm -hmm. got to make more I've got to figure out I'm going to compete and oh god I didn't want to make beer today I wanted to do a different thing but you know <laughs> like yeah. so it's always the danger I think of like you know monetizing doing what you enjoy is great but then suddenly you get to a point where you're not enjoying it anymore um, absolutely absolutely a cautionary tale. yeah a cautionary tale and on that, <laughs> on that note of caution um if people want to get in touch with you then graham spiralseed.co.uk um mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating as always i've learned a lot of stuff i didn't know about uh all the, particularly all the forest stuff. I think that's really interesting. Oh, yeah. And I'll, kept, I'll try to keep it short, believe it or not, because I do go down <laughs> a big rabbit hole on that one. Well, maybe we can do a long one, that, yeah, 24 <laughs> hour one or something like that. <laughs> cool. But look, thank you so uh, much yeah, for your time. Radical bro. mycology stuff. Oh, and one other thing I would say oh, go um, on, yeah. check out the books of, um, or check out The Idler, Tom Hodgkinson. Uh, He's done a couple of books, How to Be Idle, How to Be Free. I think they're good. And myself and Tom, we've run courses together as well on kind of like, you know, thinking about, you know, well, we called it Ditch Your Day Job the first time we did it. Yeah. And then, uh, well, we actually met at um, Dial House. Penny Rambo had actually introduced us and said, oh, you two should get on. And, you know, we did. We kind of hit it off and uh, <clears throat> found a lot of congruence between what he was talking about. When he talks about idle, you know, is the busiest, busiest idler I know. Um, but we ran this course called Ditch Your Day Job, and some people got the wrong impression. They thought it was about, you know, teaching you how to fiddle your benefits or something like that, but it which it wasn't at all, you know. Yeah. But it was, you know, about a lot of the stuff we've been talking about today. So I'd recommend his books. He's got another book relatively recently. Sorry, we're trying to wrap up. Okay. Another book came out relatively recently called Business for Bohemians, which is um, uh, That's interesting. I recommend a read of. Yeah, yeah, check that out. That talks about yeah. a lot of this stuff as well. 
And I think he'd make a good guest as well. He'd be up for it, I'm sure. Yes, I, yes, I, I suspect so, yeah. Yeah, he uh, yeah. gave my book a very nice review once upon a time in some big paper. Yeah, yeah. Cool, okay. <laughs> yeah, lovely chap he is. Okay, anyway, sorry, I'll just... Sort of stick that in as a no, thank, thank you for doing yeah, that. So, no, lots no. of references. I'll put as many as I can under the videos when they hit YouTube. And um, I'm not going to be able to stick around after this one, unfortunately, Graham. No so, problem. No problem. But well, thank you so much for your time. Well. You've been well, uh, you. a fantastic guest, Graham Burnett, Spiral Seed. Thank you very much. Great. See you. Uh, see you soon. Yes. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. bye.